Tonight on Philly Cam Voices, we have a segment on Philadelphia youth and their concerns for the upcoming election. A piece on the Philadelphia Museum of Arts kickoff event for Hispanic Heritage Month. A segment on a dance performance from local and international artists. And a segment with formerly wrongfully incarcerated men. Exonerees voting for the very first time. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to Philly Cam Voices. I'm your host, Sheila Lorette Emerson. Renee Smith Fellows, Nate, Nat, and Terrell spoke with Philly youth about the political issues that matter to them, like gun laws, reproductive rights, and health care. They also talked with a PA youth vote rep, highlighting the need to empower young people to get involved. This report sheds light on what's driving the next generation of changemakers in Philadelphia. The youth have a lot of concerns on the pressing issues of Philadelphia, but what can they do about it? We are the Philly Cam Fellows, Nate, Nat, and Terrell at Philly Cam, a public access media center located in Philadelphia. And we spoke to the youth to gather insight on what those concerns are. Hi, my name is Nate from Philly Camp, and over the past couple of days, the fellows and I have interviewed youth 18 to 24 on their opinions on what's important in their community and in politics. What political issues resonate with you the most? The political issue that resonates with me the most would be like gun laws. I feel like that needs to be a change because of everything that's been happening within like the past couple of years. Just like gun violence on school campuses and stuff like that. What political issues do you resonate with the most? Uh, well, right now, Definitely reproductive health. Um, obviously black issues, I'm black. What political issues do you resonate with the most? Uh, political issues that resonate with me are anything that affects health care, um, anything that affects sort of uh, safety, civil service, uh, like our, our three uh, first responding services, medical, uh, fire, and police. Um, yeah, those are, those are the big ones that I, I kind of get super involved with. What political issues do you resonate with the most? I'd say probably one of the biggest ones for me is just kind of coming back to a more peaceful environment, not just America, but also the world. Because, um, I mean, you know, over the past couple of years, there's been some crazy, you know, it just feels like things are kind of getting out of hand a bit. So I'd like it to return to the norm again. And that wraps up our interviews. Over the past couple of days, we got some wonderful insight on the minds of the youth. I'm Nathan Philly Camp, logging off. After speaking to the youth, we found some common concerns such as women's rights, mass poverty, like inequality in Philly, unemployment, there's not enough health care for a bunch of communities, police reform, climate change. We later spoke to PA Youth Vote Representative Sarah Julia Marion to find action plans and solutions for the youth. PA Youth Vote is a nonpartisan collaboration of youth, educators, and organizations working to elevate youth voices, improve public school civics education, and empower youth as civic actors. Civic engagement is the ability to exercise the rights and the different opportunities you have as a citizen and the exercising of working with your community. I feel like it's important to get youth to vote, but I think it goes back to we're taught at such a young age that we don't need to move all the politics, we don't need to be getting it, we don't need to be involved in it, we don't need to ask questions, and as we progress, as we get older, it's harder for us to grapple and understand why we should be voting, and there's so much pressure that gets put on us to vote, but we spend so much time being told, you don't need to know about politics, stay out of grown folk business, and then when it comes time to vote, 
we don't even know what to do because when you ask the questions, you've been pushed away. So it, it's a yes and no for me, honestly, now. What else can someone do besides vote? I think, again, reaching out to grassroots organizations, working with local leaders, politicians, and emailing, reaching out to state legislators, as well as just anyone who is in the authority of power. But I think also, again, using your voice, using social media, and going back to utilizing the resources that you have as an individual is a way that you can really increase the awareness. What is a grassroots organization? A grassroots organization is an organization or a group of individuals that work to help implement change throughout different practices and policies and procedures. And a lot of the grassroots organizations that I've worked with have been specifically with high school students where we've been learning how to get civically engaged, how to engage with our government, ourselves. We're learning different opportunities and different ways to be able to engage with our local leaders and also creating the change throughout the initiatives and things that we feel are important in our communities. Do you think voting is enough to change a community? I think yes, voting could change a community. <laughs> it's enough because it's everyone rallying together, as I said earlier, and coming together for a cause that's important to them. And when it comes to them, that them is the community. And a community can affect a state, a community can affect, uh, affect a city, and a community can affect the world. After gathering youth voices and opinions, what did we take away from this? No, I feel like that we are the future and the youth is the future and I feel like it's important that the city or the community is proper for them to have to grow up in. A project for my community, I'm not doing this for myself and I'm not um, doing this you know, for personal gain, but I'm doing this because I want to send a message out to the youth that they are powerful in their own right. We really shouldn't just be bystanders and the bystander effect is like ingrained in us when we're young like because everyone around us kind of does everything for us or we think that someone else is going to do it for us or it's just kind of already out of our hands but it's really not I would just say like don't be scared and just do it because like if you don't do it now like when are you gonna do it as our journeys and outreach with our local youth concluded we were left with a deep understanding of how important it is to get our youth civically engaged to get their voices heard we have seen that engagement takes many forms voting volunteering protesting, and even simple acts of kindness. Each action, no matter how small, contributes to the fabric of our society. It's clear that when people come together with a shaped purpose, they can overcome challenges and build a better future together. Community reporter Bettina Escarisa brings us a segment on the Philadelphia Museum of Arts kickoff celebration for Hispanic and Latina Heritage Month. Let's check it out. I'm Camilla Rondon. Uh, we are here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art celebrating the Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month uh, kickoff. We will be here all month long with various programming surrounding the amazing cultura, not just here in the community, but the worldwide community of Latinx artists, people, and our histories and backgrounds. Yeah, so we really want to highlight all month long, but especially this evening, we have a live performance from a band called Gonchinangos with also a DJ in between. And we have the amazing Cindy Lazito, whose artwork is actually behind me and whose artwork is used throughout the museum and through our marketing, um, really embracing and showcasing her Puerto Rican heritage. And just today we have amazing food and drinks and just music but also ways to interact and make your own things, like the bandana that Cindy's doing in the workshop, but also to see amazing artwork. We have a beautiful Maria Berrio up that's in our galleries right off the Great Stair Hall, and that is a work called A Cloud's Roots, talking about migration and how really vibrant and um, resilient migrants are specifically and not specifically to Latin American migrants who come here. We also have amazing artwork by Roberto Lugo on our third floor, who is a local Philly legend. And we also have the amazing Diego Rivera works up on the second floor. My name is Cindy Lozito. I am a muralist, illustrator, and cartoonist based in South Philadelphia by way of Queens, New York. So tonight it's Friday night at 5 p.m. We are currently at my pop-up studio on the balcony of the Great Stair Hall at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, celebrating Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. 
For this celebration, I created a bunch of artwork. A lot of it has to do with my family and specifically the history of my grandmother as a seamstress. I incorporated family photos of my relatives, my cousins, my mom, my sister, and of course my grandparents as a way to honor them and things that I found in you know, their, their bedroom and their bedside when I was growing up. The pop-up studio that's happening behind me and is part of this collaboration that I am calling the Fabric of Belonging is an opportunity for people to make their own handkerchief inspired by home the way I was inspired by my home while creating this artwork. This particular event, it's just been so wonderful to see people engaging with my artwork, but also spending time thinking about what makes them feel like they're at home, how they feel like they belong, and expressing that through the artwork. When I was working on this project, I really dug deep in my memories and thought about what was the food, what were the thoughts that, you know, made things feel like they were homey and and felt me but felt for me like they were a sense of belonging and it's really fun to see people have their own take on that through things like florals and um, images of home and and just whatever that means for them however they feel safe and secure within the confines of artwork community reporter Bettina Escarisa brings us a segment recorded during the 2024 Philadelphia Fringe Festival featuring two dance performances. Let's see what they had to say. My name is Vasiliki Papavastoliou. My artist name is Tarantism. I am from Greece. It's my first time in the USA. I'm here um, for this whole month uh, to tour my solo piece Panopticon uh, with Mignola Dance and their piece Self Help. So it's a split build performance and we are touring in different cities uh, at the East Coast, uh, including Toronto. So my piece is called Panopticon, and it's an architectural system, like a prism that was invented by Jeremy Bentham. It never actually happened, but it was more of a metaphor. So basically in this prison, all the cells were open to the guard, and the people could be seen at any time which meant they had to be in their best behavior the whole time. And they didn't know when the guard was going to like see them or like they didn't know when they were being surveilled. So they always have to be at their best behavior. And then Michel Foucault said this is like how like this system is how society works at the moment and how and people like as humans we have internalized the system and this is what we do to ourselves so even if nobody's watching us we always try to be on our best behavior one of the books that has inspired me a lot is the book uh, the heart of a man by eric Fromm, where he talks about biophilus and necrophilus person and by biophilus it means loving life and life is unpredictable is constantly changing while necrophilus is about loving whatever is dead and whatever we can control i feel like in today's world we have this tendency to want to control everything and we have this fascination with like ai technology and i was thinking you know we say the word futuristic and when we say futuristic the first thing that comes in mind is technology and it's like why is like futuristic is just about the future and why we connect this to technology and the mechanical world instead of like humanity and life and i started yeah like for me i had this moment of like oh wow this is like we really try to control life like this is where it's going we try and because the more things are like dead, like we can control dead material and we want to try and make everything mechanical so we can control it. And so like, yeah, this system, as I said before, is also a very internalized system. And for me, like the hands are like the manipulator. There is this control system that always when I try to get the control over the body and the body is more like the instinct that tries to rebel. And so we constantly see this machine-like person uh, that has a soul inside that is being stuck and wants to come out. And there is this constant battle in the piece. Hi, I'm Ariel. 
And I'm Charlie, and we're the co-directors of Mignolo Dance, based currently in New Jersey, although we're all over the place. We started creating together, well, we started creating together a long time ago as sisters, but we started as a company in 2017. And we started this piece that we're showing today and on this small tour that we're going on called Self Help in 2021. We're doing a small tour of the East Coast, so we've been in New York, now we're in Philly, we're going to Jersey City, and then for the first time we're going to Canada, we're going to Toronto. And the piece is about mental health awareness. Uh, it follows a dialogue between a therapist and a patient, and but there's also some sort of weird identity things going on and um, ideas about progress and what progress means in the context of mental health. We're in the process of creating a movement language called Move English, which each move corresponds with the word that is either spoken or not spoken. Um, so the word the is like boom, and the word where is like, it also involves the whole body, but uh, there's gestures and body motions that have a word for word correlation. And we've been working on that since 20, 18? 2018, 2019, and we wanted to do more with this, and we also wanted to continue exploring um, mental health awareness, and it's something that we're very familiar with, this setting of being a patient and seeing a therapist, and we felt like we had enough background information to accurately portray it, and it gave us a great way to like create a script and then um, uh, develop our movement language more. Yeah, so we were interested in finding a way that previously the movement language had been more of like a monologue, and we were interested in finding a way to have a dialogic structure. So that's kind of, well, what kind of dialogue do we really want to be having? And um, both of us have been in therapy on and off for a really long time, and that's something, the destigmati destigmatization of mental health related issues is something that's close to both of our hearts and so um, we started as a small project and it kept expanding from there. One thing that we're interested in and one thing that brought us into this uh, working with text super directly is we've had a lot of experiences even with our friends though and they're artists too and they'll come to a show and they're like yeah I just I just didn't really get it and it's like oh we, we really want people to feel like they have some kind of access to dance and there's so many reasons why people don't feel they have access to dance that I won't get into but for us using text, and not just like throwing text on top of a dance and seeing what happens, but really using the text as the grounds from which to create the movement, creates something for anyone to connect to. Like I believe that a random person on the street who's never been to the theater could take something from this because of the way that we're using the body and the text together. And so that's sort of about our work in general. And then, I mean, with this piece in particular, just both having been through a lot of different things <laughs> on the mental health spectrum. I think a lot of conversations about mental health only happen with your very closest people, if at all. And I think kind of talking about things without embarrassment and being like, yeah, these are the things that, that we go through our minds and just bringing those forward in a like an unabashed way is, yeah, is something that's important to us and that I think that's been the most interesting reaction that we get from people. Like people after the shows are like, wow, I've had that exact thought before and never articulated it out loud or something like that. And we've also had uh, the honor of having some therapists in the audience. And something that we do in the piece is try to also show that the therapist is a person too. And I think that that has, uh, when we've talked to people who are in the field uh, after the show, they have also, been like, wow, this is so interesting to see this portrayed outside of this very private room where the all, there's all of this, um, what's that thing called where you can't share any information at a doctor? Confidentiality. Yeah, there's like a lot of confidentiality, which makes sense, but it's like this is us being really open and sharing this thing that's usually held so tight and so confidential and just kind of like, it doesn't feel super vulnerable for us now, I think, because we've done it a lot, but um, for people watching, they're like, whoa, this is like people in a really vulnerable place in public, and I think that's really important for us as well. Community reporter Chinchilla Jonicia interviews four formerly wrongfully imprisoned but recently exonerated men. Daniel Gwynn, Muti Esagboro, Eddie Ramirez, and James Lambert, who spent decades behind bars for crimes they did not commit. They have never voted and will share what it's like to be able to vote for the very first time in their lives. 
This is Dr. Chinchilla Jonicia of Three Cam Voices. This painting was drawn by Daniel Gwynn, an exoneree. Hear his story and other exonerees on the importance of voting. Hey everybody, this is your girl, Dr. Chinchilla Jonicia, the Queen of Justice, and I am standing here now with Daniel Gwynn. He was wrongfully incarcerated for 30 years at the age of 24. He was just released from prison back in February of this year, February 28th, 2024. This uh, month, the 28th, will mark eight months that Daniel has been out of prison. Prior to being kidnapped uh, from your family, thrown into the slave plantation, the modern day slave plantations, uh, were you a voter prior to being wrongfully incarcerated? No, I was too young um, at the time to understand the voting process. Okay, but you were 24. But too young in my mind to understand the voting process. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So you didn't really see like the significance of voting or no. you know anything like that at that time. No. Okay. So now during your 30 years of being wrongfully incarcerated, um, looking at like the news, would you all can watch TV, and watch the news, and see the different things going on with the elections and everything. Um, did that like trigger anything? Like wow. Voting is important or anything like that? Absolutely. Because the nonsense that I've seen going on in the, uh, the news, uh, it was ridiculous how some of these people that was being voted into office weren't doing their jobs. If anything, they was doing things that hurt the people more so than help the people. Now that you are a free man, did you have an opportunity to vote during the primary this year? Absolutely. That's one of the things I did as soon as I got out was I registered to vote. Okay. And then I got to vote in the general. And just Friday, mm -hmm. I got to uh, submit my ballot for, for the, the general. The primary is in April. So it's all, it's the primary first, the general in November. Well, see, I still have a lot to learn, but there's Yeah, it's more. okay. But guess what? You registered and you voted. That's right. So that, that's the thing. So um, now, how did it feel to vote for the very first time at the age of 54, first time voting in your whole life? How did that feel, Dan? Exhilarating. And it still does because I got to vote again for the, for this next election. Okay. Presidency, okay. Which awesome. is very important. Awesome. Awesome. So what would you say to people or those who think that their voice uh, or their vote doesn't matter, that doesn't count? What would you say to them? Every vote counts. Hey, everybody. It's your girl, Dr. Chinchilla Jonicia, the Queen of Justice. And I am sitting here right now with Muti Ajamu Husebaru. We're going to be talking about the importance of voting because Muti, he was wrongfully incarcerated for 42 years behind bars for a crime that he did not commit. And Muti was a teenager, okay? And so we're going to talk about that tonight with the fact that Muti did not get a chance to vote because he was kidnapped from his family at the young age of how old, Muti? 17. The young age of 17, everybody. And we know that you can't register to vote until you're 18 years old. So Muti never had that opportunity to register to vote prior to being kidnapped from his family. And Muti just got out of prison last year, June 23rd, 2023, at the age of 59. When you got out, we were embarking on last year's uh, general election, which was coming up in November. Um, so how soon after you were released from prison, how soon did you register to vote? It was right away. Okay, okay. Right away. Okay. And did you vote in November last year yes. during the general election? Absolutely. Okay. And so now that was your very first time voting in your entire life. Yes. Wow. So at that, and then you were 60 I took years pictures old. pictures of it and everything. Okay, so at the age of 60, yeah. that was the very first time you voted. How did that feel for you? The thing that I enjoyed about the process, because I wanted to pose mm -hmm. and got to see how things go on behind the scenes. Yeah. That's what really, like, got me, like, okay. excited. I remember you had your little I voted sticker. Yeah. 
and I had that joint on my phone, it faded, though. I, I, I learned, don't put it on your phone. It's not gonna last. I did. Oh, so you don't have your first high voted cigarette anymore. Right. Well, you can get another one and put it in your scrapbook. Hey, hey, Eddie, how are you? Great. Good, good. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hey, everybody, this is Dr. Chinchilla Jonesia, the Queen of Justice, and I am sitting here with Eddie Ramirez. Eddie had his wrongful conviction overturned last year, November 30th, right? November 30th. November 30th of 2023, after 27 years? 27, yeah. yeah. Almost, almost 28 years. Almost 28 uh, years, wow. How old were you, Eddie, when you were wrongfully incarcerated, kidnapped from your family, maybe, uh, you know? I was uh, 19, maybe 28. Okay, wow, wow. So at 18, did you register to vote at 18? I had not registered. Okay. I, but that was the, one of the first things I did when I came home. Okay. 18, you didn't register. So 19, you were kidnapped off the streets from your family and didn't wasn't out in society again until 27 years later. Mm -hmm. um, so you never had an opportunity to vote. Um, and so while you were on the inside, did you ever think about voting and what it may be like to be able to vote. Yeah, you know, well, I never thought about, I, I can't say what it would be like to vote, but mm -hmm. I thought about the importance of voting. Okay. Um, because I, I had, I come from a community where it seemed, it seemed like a lot of people were doing a lot of complaining. Mm -hmm. And the, the complaints were legit, they were justified, okay. but not really doing a lot to change their conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and in prison, uh, I became a part of a social organization okay. that really represented the Latino community. Okay. And I would meet people who would tell me so much. They wanted, they wanted so many things to change, and I would say, okay, well, then help me change them. Yes. And that's when they would just be like, oh, man, well, I've got other things to do. But I'm like, wow. They have to prioritize. Yeah. Um, and so I, yeah. I would think, well, this is what, this is what our civic duty of voting is like. Okay. That we okay. have a responsibility. Yes. It's, a, it's not just a privilege, it's a responsibility. Yes. You, you know, you, your voice is heard with your vote. It, because it is the first step to say, I am here, I am a citizen, I have rights, mm -hmm. these are the changes that I want. It is, because if you don't vote, mm -hmm. and you try to stir up yeah. action, yeah. then it's just, you're just being a hypocrite. Right. It, it starts with the vote. Hey everybody, this is Dr. Chinchilla Jonesia, the Queen of Justice, and uh, I'm standing here in Harrisburg at the state capitol and in Pennsylvania, okay? And listen, today we had our wrongful conviction awareness day event and a press conference for exoneration compensation. And Monk, as we call him, but his name is James Lambert, he was wrongfully incarcerated, everybody, for 30, 35 years, 35 years, with 33 of those years he spent on death row. James was 32 years old when he was wrongfully incarcerated, everybody, and um, prior to your wrongful incarceration, were you a voter? No, I was not. You were I, not I, a voter? I hadn't voted up to that point. Okay. And why didn't you vote up until Well, that? because I, I wasn't political and I never, I didn't trust politicians anyway, so what's the point of voting? Okay. So I, you know, and, you know, so I just never vote. I never really, you know, I, even though the vote was important, mm -hmm. it, you know, I didn't think my, you know, so I never vote. Okay, so did you think that your vote wouldn't count? Yeah, I didn't think it would count anyway. Okay, you okay. Know what I mean? At that point. Okay. Even up, even up to 32. Okay, because you were 32 years old, and so for those years from uh, 18 32. to 32, you never voted. Never voted. And then you were kidnapped off the street, thrown behind bars, convicted years. of a crime you didn't commit for 35 years. years. And were you allowed to vote in prison? Oh, no, no. What? <laughs> so when you were in prison, did you ever think about, wow, I should have voted while I was out? As time goes on, as time went on, and, you know, my thought pro pro process, my thought pattern was seeing different things, and I was having different understandings, clearer understandings. Catch the rest of that segment on YouTube. Thank you for joining, tuning in to this episode. You can also watch our show on YouTube and Roku. And follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We'll see you next time.